there's a lot of uh, misconceptions surrounding life. And when I was in college, um, I had a misconception that if I had checks in my checkbook, I still had money. Um, unfortunately, I saw this uh, more than I want to admit. Um, not only is that a misconception, people outside the church have misconceptions about what we believe and why we do things. So that's one that we get to deal with, but that's on the tail end of this message rather than the front. And um, there's a lot of misconceptions about God, quite frankly. There's uh, a number of people that see him as a uh, nice and uh, smiling grandpa who wants to give you just absolutely everything. And um, he kind of winks at sin. He winks at uh, when you do wrong. And it's not really that big a deal. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, in fact, there was a witness on a Facebook page recently that I had and uh, somebody was having a hard day and they had been in my first church and so I wrote something back to him about, you know, uh, thank God that Jesus walks with us. And somebody replied to that, would you please not put religion into everything? People stop drinking the Kool-Aid. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I want to respond to that one, but, you know, but there's a misconception there that, you know, we're like the Jim Jones kind of things, you know, where he had his whole church drink a poison and because they were going to heaven and they couldn't go unless they were dead. So um, that was a number of years ago, and thank God nobody's doing that again. You know, but th th people have this uh, misconception about what's going on with church. And then we've got this problem. Jesus is speaking in our text. And he uses a word that we as Lutheran Christians don't like. In fact, we really struggle with it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And he doesn't say it just once. You know, verse 21, that was verse 15. Verse 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them. Oh, Jesus, he did it again. And then it gets worse. He says, that's the one who loves me. You mean if I just go to church and I just, you know, wander back out and live my life however I want to and, and don't let my faith influence how I live my life then? I don't really love Jesus. You want to argue with him? So there must be something that we've got to have to kind of back up and re-understand some of these things. Both of those verses have to do with obedience. And our problem with obedience is too often we think it's like this. Sit, stay, don't do nothing. Oh, come on, that's funny. <laughs> Goodness. You know, and, and, and we think about, you know, obedience as, as well, we got to go to training, we got to do stuff we don't like, and, you know, all of this kind of jump through hoops and do the challenge courses and all the other trainings that they put dogs through. And then you notice the verse in Hebrews that said Jesus was obedient to his father to death, even death on a cross. And you've got to say obedience must mean something different. Now, if we're to be Christ followers, I had a professor at the seminary who used to call us Christians, not Christians. Of course, he was from Australia, so we... He was, everything he said was kind of interesting. 
<laughs> and, but he called us Christians, followers of Christ. He was emphasizing to be like Jesus, to be a follower. What does that mean? Oh, wait, that's a Lutheran question. What does this mean? Yes, we give thanks for grace. But what does it mean to be like and have a life of response to his command? Well, let's clear up a couple of things here first. Um, because we swim in a society that doesn't like a number of words and also assumes the understanding of other ones. So let's start with that. Everybody understands what faith means. We never question it. We never define it. We always assume everybody knows faith. And that was the problem for the Church of the Reformation. We are in 2017. In 1517, Martin Luther began to discuss these things. He nailed 95 theses to the door. And so at the time of the Reformation, that church understood faith as referring to knowledge. And quite frankly, in the United States of America today, we are really fascinated with how we think. We're enamored with that from their point of view and our society's point of view, knowing Jesus' historical knowledge of what he did for sinful humanity would be important. And so faith could never be alone, even though Lutheran Christians say it is what? Faith alone that saves. No, they said it's faith and knowledge that saves. you got to know what you believe. So it's faith and, not faith only. So therefore, faith has to be accompanied by a work. Unfortunately, that is the society we swim in. Many view faith as mere knowledge, and so they deny baptism. They deny the work of the Holy Spirit to create faith, no matter what the age, because God isn't impressed with our smarts. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to think. He alone saves. All of salvation is from God, just like everything that we are and have is from God. He created it. This all starts in the heart and the mind of God, not humans. And it's a little humbling to understand that. So a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ will deny baptism to young kids because they're not cognizant yet. And since the infant isn't old enough to know what Jesus has done, they couldn't possibly have faith. However, the flip side of that coin is, is that you and I should have childlike faith. We should have faith that, what? Doesn't question when God throws you up in the air, so to speak, and is he going to catch you? Like we do with little children. Childlike faith is equated with being blissfully ignorant about the church's teachings. Don't need to know those if Jesus died for me. I don't need anything more. Isn't that enough? I don't even need to go to church. Once saved, always saved. And thereby it becomes your decision to follow Jesus. Now, if you just set that issue aside for the moment, now let's tackle another issue in our society because we live in Texas, the United States. Thank you very much. We don't obey. We put on our leather jacket, get on our two-wheel vehicle, and we head off to wherever we want to go. 
the notion of obedience runs afoul of American sense of freedom and liberty. Obedience violates our sense of mutuality and partnership in relationships. That's why obey is so many uh, brides and grooms <clears throat> take that word out of the vows because they don't understand what it means. It runs counter to defiant individualism. So we put on our leather jacket. And yes, I do have one. And I have two leather vests. And yes, I do have a two-wheel vehicle. Just see how independent you are if you put that jacket on and ride on the wrong side of the road. Obedience is a good thing. And then we got Jesus saying obedience is good. It's God's will for us. It's how he intends a life for us. And it must be, therefore, more than obedience to laws. Is it a life that is filled with the memories of what God has done to bring us together? His, his work, not our work, his sending of his son, his grace that is extended to us. It's marked <clears throat> by our reciting, yes, of God's laws and using them, a third use of the law, guidelines now. Because now we know how God thinks. Paul tells us we have the mind of Christ. We know what God thinks of us. We know how it is. It's God's work. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Oh, and that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. The miracle of faith is God's work. And that's why we as Lutheran Christians say this. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. It is all God in terms of salvation. And because of what he did, we follow in his footsteps because we begin to see, yes, this is the best possible way to live. So what does that look like? What does that feel like? How do we think if we're a follower of Jesus? Everybody's different. We heard about the graduates up here and how different their lives are going to be. We start with that mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. If we have the mind of Christ, then how would Christ think? Especially about that Yahoo who cut me off at the last traffic light to sit in front of me in my lane when I should have been first. Now, some of you are smiling because you know what that means. We all want to win the stoplight war. <laughs> Isn't it? Don't we? I mean, it's, oh, man, and it was a truck. I can't even see around it. I should get a bigger car. You know? But am I thinking like Jesus? Would Jesus be asking his father to bless that truck driver? Do you think like Jesus when you drive past a friend's house? You pray for them? You know, I, this all started, by the way, for me on the road. You know, when somebody did that kind of thing, you know, and, and kind of cut me off, or like the guy this morning, I'm going 70 miles an hour on the Chisholm Trail Parkway, and this guy is passing me like I'm in reverse. God bless them because they obviously need it. I mean, sometimes these prayers start out with gritted teeth, but after a while, when you keep doing it, when it becomes a habit, when you start to think like Jesus, then those prayers, your teeth kind of unclench. And it becomes easier time after time. And then you say, okay, Holy Spirit, now, 
What do I do? How do I handle this situation? How can I be a blessing? How can this loss of a job or loss of health or more months than the money, you know, all of the, how can those things work out for me, for my good? Oh, wait a minute. There's a love that's involved here. And if you think of families, and you think why families do certain things together, and they set a pattern for each other, and the children learn from the parents and learn from the grandparents. This is what we do in this family. This is how we show love to each other. This is how we care for each other. Then it no longer becomes a command. It becomes what the family does. And you've got an earthly family, and so you can understand that. But you also have a heavenly family. You are children of the heavenly Father. And this is what his family does in caring for one another. So we follow the commands, not because they're commands, but because they are the pattern of our older brother, Jesus Christ, who loves us enough that he went to the cross and he says, follow me. To him be the glory. Amen.